let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaming and everything in its orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim. So let's get into it. Today we have a guest returning. Today we have So Dot Bear Cub back with us. Oh my god. Hi So, how are you? Hi everyone. I'm doing great. How are we doing today? Yeah, good. Doing good. Doing good. good. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad to be back here. Thanks for inviting me back once again. Well, you know, we absolutely had to have you uh, because, and to be fair, I haven't listened to the episode in a minute. I can't recall if we discussed uh, this particular character on your original episode um, about muscle gaining, although we may have done. Uh, I, think he, he, I think he might have come up. Uh, have come up. I'll have to listen yeah, we back. Probably, we probably referenced him at least. It would make sense. But essentially, because we had you on for the muscle gaining episode, you were so gracious telling us about your story, your history, what's kind of inspired you, which of course involves none other than Gaston, who, fun fact, uh, today is the 30th anniversary of Beauty and the Beast. So it's 30 years of Gaston, everyone. Ah, yes. <laughs> I know you were all gagging about it, weren't you? Um, <laughs> But I thought that it could be fun just to kind of circle around to this topic today because, you know, we've done this once or twice before, you know, where we sort of talk about the anniversary of an iconic gainer film. And, you know, uh, so when we spoke about this, you'd said it's obviously not, you know, the most major thing in like common gainer parlance, but amongst muscle gainers, this was quite the film, right? And and just gay men in general, like, I think that that was such an iconic moment that so many people can, like, think back to. Um, I've heard from way too many people, both within and out of the community, that they're like, oh, yeah, I used to rewind to that part all the time, you know, back when they had VHS tapes. Really? I See, I'm surprised by this. I guess I just never thought about Gaston at all because he's such a toxic asshole in the film that, like, just renders him completely... <laughs> you know boring uninteresting like i don't think he's one of disney's better villains oh he's certainly not but tim i think that's a testament to how evolved you might be as a person because you know most people see that and they're like daddy yes please and you know it's reflected in a lot of the kinds of relationships people pursue in real life i i've dated my fair share of men like gaston so obviously i still have some psychological problems but like i just didn't <laughs> find his characterization at all appealing like i didn't even think he was animated to look that handsome like i kind of oh, thought yeah. he looked a little weird well and that's the thing right some, some people are drawn to like extreme beauty and you know you see people in like the body modification community and people who are really into like plastic surgery and things you know aspiring to these ideals and like we see pretty squidward as a meme nowadays you know it's almost like a step further than gaston right he's got like the huge butt chin the like the bulbous forehead the cheekbones you know, it's like kind of in that direction. And you're but you're absolutely right. The characterization would you would lead you to believe on its own. Yeah, he's terrible. But people are superficial. And I think those I of us who may have, you know, struggled with superficiality <laughs> in the past, you know, we're like, oh, he's great. He's wonderful. I can look past it. I can change him, you know. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, speaking of somebody who tried that for 13 years, trust me, it doesn't work. <laughs> No, exactly, exactly. Um, but you know, some of us uh, learn. Well, you know, some of us learn the hard way, and and some of us, you know, see danger. Yeah, I learned the hard run, <laughs> as as have I in the past. For the record, I mean, I love this. Just everyone on this podcast is acknowledging, like, oh, I I love my toxic men, and I haven't grown or learned from that experience. Uh, not me, of course. I've never struggled with men in the slightest. <laughs> problems as a perfect person i can't relate to you plebs and your struggles uh but that must be really difficult for you mustn't it? Well, i'm sure this is going to go down like a lead balloon here is an unpopular opinion but the way that i view it now is like okay if you're really like that toxic and stupid but like i still find you hot i'll fuck you but i definitely won't date you i mean i think that's a healthy middle ground you engage with them to the extent that is healthy that's called honoring your boundaries and then you move on <laughs> I love that. We call that compromise. And it sounds like what Tim wants to do is chomp them thighs. So 
Well, I'm glad that you have that outlook on it because I just thought that made me a slut. We make all these jokes about me being slutty, but like, is that not a true um, indication of my slut dumb is that I'm willing to fuck men who are that toxic, but I'm definitely not going to date them. Uh, Tim, I believe that's called having your cake and eating it too, uh, which uh, for the podcast is very appropriate. <laughs> which is, thank you. So thank you. As gainers, we get to choose our cake and eat it too. Um, sorry, sorry. Me, yes. <laughs> in, in the RuPaul stop. <clears throat> you know, as gainers, we get to choose our cake. Um, thank you thank you but listen um you know we we obviously watched the film as a sort of we're talking about this film of course let's rewatch it i mean to the pair of you what what are your thoughts on the film yeah so um on the film more than anything i mean y'all know I'm, I'm a very musical person um and the the biggest thing that's always stood out to me about that film was the score i always felt like little mermaid had it beat as far as the visuals but the, with the score, I always liked um, Beauty and the Beast more. It stood out to me a lot. And Gaston's voice actually makes him stand out among the cast. He's got this very big, robust, um, operatic baritone character um, voice that that pairs well with the, the physical appearance of his character. And I think that he's not only visually memorable to a lot of people, but also they, they hear the sound they're like, oh, that's what Gaston sounds like. He's very low. He's very masculine, you know? Before I answer the question, I would like to ask both of you, what year in the 90s were you born? Are you an 80s kid, Tim? Yeah, I was born in 83. Oh, God So bless. I actually saw this in theaters. I remember being taken to see this in a theater, but I have a feeling that neither one of you was actually taken to a theater when it first aired. Maybe what? like when it came out of the vault and did a second go yeah. around, you might have seen it, but... What year did it premiere? Uh, 1992, I think. Oh, so just a year before I was born. Yeah. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, I was the one who actually saw this in theaters. Nice. Yeah. I exactly. Because, you know, people don't realize how much older than, the, than most of the people who come on this show. But anyway. He says he was born in 83. What he means, he was born in 1383. Okay. So don't get it twisted. <laughs> okay. He, he couldn't get in on concession for his childhood permit. Okay. Uh, he had to pay full adult fares. Just saying. <laughs> But I remember when this movie came out, there was a lot of press about it because it was like, it was really ambitious. It, I think they spent more money on this film than they spent on The Little Mermaid. They were using a yeah. lot more CGI at the time. Like, and that was still kind of up and coming uh, in 92. And it also got nominated for Best Picture of the Year, which was the first time that a, an animated film had been nominated in that category. Huh. So it was a big deal. Um, looking back on it now when I rewatch it, yeah, I have a nostalgia for it. But then I also like my cynical brain like starts taking over and I'm like Stockholm syndrome. Like this is an unhealthy relationship. So <laughs> I have sort of mixed feelings about it now. Um, That's fair. Yeah. By the way, uh, a friend of mine, Gio, uh, co-hosts a podcast called Your Bare Necessities, uh, which actually recently covered this film. It is a gay Disney podcast. So listeners, go check it out. It was a fabulous episode. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. And I think it's interesting because isn't that like the meme? Like every princess apparently had like something majorly wrong with her. Like yeah. uh, Sleeping Beauty mm -hmm. was narcoleptic. You know, she wasn't, but she was asleep. So I guess Snow White was anemic or, or some kind of. Well, I, th I think the problematic thing that people started pointing out, especially with Disney in the past, was like, OK, Snow White and Aurora were both kissed without their consent by a man that they barely knew. And yeah. then while they, they were in a... married them while they were and they teenagers. Were a... And they could not consent in the yeah. state that they were in. They were exactly on some level intoxicated or incapacitated. You know, I think Ariel got a lot of flack for giving up her family, her life, her whole world for one guy and her voice, you know, all that just to get a vagina. Um, <laughs> and a because essentially that's exactly Don't what forget. happened. <laughs> her legs, honey. Although wasn't there like an episode of Futurama where like Fry went to the bottom of the ocean and they were like, it's okay. We'll let you stay with the mermaid girl that you've fallen in love with. And he obviously like went to her bed to have sex. And she was like, because I'm going to, lay about a thousand eggs and you're gonna inseminate them right <laughs> and he's like fleeing the scene because the the fantasy is gone there is no sex he was looking for that's right he was looking for that mermaid mermosi i'm not sure what the <laughs> clinical term is for that. he wanted he wanted that cloaca he wanted to click clack with the cloac <laughs> girl no exactly um, but you see. know if we're talking 
yeah, the, the mermaids. But if we're circling back to, to um, I almost said Little Mermaid, dear God, um, Beauty and the Beast, um, it, you know, if you think about like like messaging, right? Like, yes, there is that issue that, you know, it does feel like Stockholm Syndrome. On the other hand, I feel like in the vein of many 90s films, or is it? Yeah, early 90s yeah, it's film. A 90s film yeah. It's got this overarching, like very kind of almost cheesy message of like, oh, you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, case in oh, point, yeah, this girl who loves reading. She loves, you know. Books. Yeah, it's like. That's, yeah. that's what makes her it, weird is she likes to read. Oh, yeah, I love that. Right. If you think about the fucking song, by the way, and they do mention this on the Your Van Necessities podcast, like she's a cunt to the villagers. Because yeah. listen to the lyrics of the song. She's like, another day in this quiet village, everything the same as it was before. All of these provincial people going about yeah. them. It's like she she calls you. them plebes essentially. She's like, you all are the peasantry going about your boring little lives, whilst I have my nose buried in a book, and I'm going to, you know, I, I can't remember who it was that I was watching that was breaking down like Belle's character, but they even said like her motivation even seems a little bit wobbly because it's like, what is it that she truly wants? She says that she wants adventure out in the great wide somewhere. So it's like, so essentially, she wants to take a road trip. Like that's her. <laughs> <laughs> major thing like ariel wanted to experience a world different to her own jasmine wanted to experience freedom on her own terms bell just wants to go on a road trip well and i think that's a testament to how people would write for women back then right it's like okay yeah she's smart and she wants more out of life great sounds like a wonderful strong female character once again if we're thinking back to the 90s this is kind of how they would write women and especially oh, yeah. if you're thinking like this is whole, like oh yeah i'm not i'm not I'm not like the other girls, you know. She's not like other girls. She's not like the other That's girls. Right. She has glasses and reads books and, you know, maybe listens to a bit of Paramour, you know, because like no one ever did that. Um, have you heard of this thing called anime? I don't suppose you ever would have because I watch anime. Like, yeah. Right. Okay. Except in, I don't know what era, French, because um, it's, it's ostensibly set in France during yes, like, the 18, Before 1700s? the revolution. So it would be, it would have to be the 17. 80s or 70s it have to be the 1770s before the revolution yeah. came somebody exactly. did do a timeline where they plotted out based on the architecture and inspirations it takes place in a very specific era like decade and then they were like well happily ever after we know didn't happen for them because based on the architecture we know that they had about 10 good years together before their heads were lobbed off by the dead tree so you know <laughs> yeah and and the original was published around like in the 1740s i mm -hmm. just found and and it ostensibly takes place yeah, yeah yeah okay so this we're we're pretty close that's good i'm glad we're not too off base <laughs> well one thing that i i really appreciate about this movie because again i'm a, i'm an aficionado of old films and i can't remember what year the movie came out it might have been 19 31 or, or sorry 1939 or 1940 jean cocteau a very famous french director made his version of beauty and the beast which had a lot of the parts of the castle alive and moving like statues would move um paintings would move you know the candelabras would move disney took more inspiration from cocteau's version than they did from anything else when they created their version mm, i did read once that yeah. the original beast inspiration was truly like hellish like he was less uh, he looked like uh like, like a, a warthog lizard. and something else mixed together yeah like some kind of like crocodile with a lizard with a snake it was like an actual mishmash of of creatures to look like something hellish. Whereas when you think about it, the beast that we know, some kind of bear wolf thing with some. It's like a. I, the, I remember I read it was like a water buffalo, a wolf, a bear, and something else that they mixed together mm -hmm. to create the look of the beast. It gives like man bear pig vibes, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> truly the original furry. You know what I mean like giving giving access. and they yeah and it's almost like furry bait in a way because he's like he's got he even being you know this horrible terrible beast he's got big shoulders you know you can tell he's lifted a, a few heavy things in the day um perhaps in, has a high protein diet <laughs> well and the remake went all out and gave him pecs and abs like you're right yeah they just <laughs> they gave him full anatomy in the um remake so <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh, if the cat's director got his hands on this, he would have just gotten like a cut rate furry suit and just stuck him in there and made him like do the moves. Oh my god, traumatizing. But listen, focusing maybe a little bit more on the man of the hour, uh, Gaston 
himself. Gaston. You know, obviously there's that iconic song, No One, da 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 ba 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 And there is a line he sings. Uh, when I was a lad, I ate four dozen eggs every morning to help me get large. And now that I'm grown, I eat five dozen eggs, so I'm roughly the size of a barge. Um, does that particular verse resonate with you so? <laughs> I mean, if I ever had to eat that many eggs in a day, I'd probably puke. Um, I think anybody would. I mean, yes, just about anybody. But, you know, it, it, as hyperbolic as it sounds, it does, you know, speak to the fact that one, you know, to be big, you got to eat big. You know, you got to lift big and you got to eat big. Um, and, you know, if you, once again, you think about the 90s, you know, information wasn't as readily available. I'm not saying that they're like spreading misinformation, but I'm just saying like it's you know it, it it touches on that idea of like oh yeah you know you lift big you eat big you get big um and you know in thinking about our topic today in this character i was also thinking about like the the visual culture of the 90s and like pop culture and you think about like the the kinds of action figures you had back then you know mm -hmm. and how what what extreme physiques they have you think also about such expressions as like on steroids and, you know, we don't say that anymore. And I think that's partially due to like some activism, you know, with regard to like um, body positivity um, and, you know, standards, right? You know, first we talk about body standards for women and then briefly we talk about body standards for men and forgot about it. Um, but, you know, as dead as that terminology is, actually the other day I was at a restaurant with some friends and uh it was a burger restaurant, uh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and one of the burgers was like burger on steroids. And I was like, what? We don't talk like that anymore. And I looked at it and, you know, right. Most health food people would be like, well, I don't want, you know, cattle that have been treated with any steroids or hormones. And it's true. You know, I don't want that either. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting how um, that kind of thinking and terminology lingers. Hmm. Like just the pervasiveness of culture, really, and how difficult it can be to change ideas, especially once they enter the zeitgeist, because, you know, it's even even something as simple as, and I was having this conversation with a friend who's Native American, the word powwow, right? I heard as a child, yes. means I would have just thought, like, it sounds very, like, peppy. Innocent. You know, yeah. like, oh, like I'm, children. A, I'm a businesswoman on the go. I've got a zip zap, you know, it's a, it's a powwow, but, 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 you know, it, it has that intonation to it where you're like, oh, it makes sense that this word has come into my cultural understanding and knowledge at this particular moment in history. And it's not until someone takes you aside and goes, actually, by the way, there is a strong context to this. It's inappropriate, blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, oh, didn't even realize. But like, I'm a millennial from Australia. And this is something very particular to like tribal people of America. Like that shit transcended continents and oceans. Living purely in the Australian context, there's no reason for me to have even like had a context to even know that that was inappropriate. It was only by virtue of having to have become more worldly, experience and meeting new people that I go, oh, I've now learned about this. And sometimes I feel like we do take for granted. We think to ourselves, oh, the world is connected now. There's no excuse for you not to know. When actually, it's actually very easy <laughs> to not know something. Um, no, exactly. Especially when it comes to all this, you know. Well, I mean, there's yeah. two types. Of, there's two types of ignorance. You know, there is the kind of like you. You honestly did not know. Like, I think benign ignorance is not a bad thing because it just hasn't been pointed out to you yet. You have not learned the information. Willful ignorance is what we're always combating. It's that thing where people could find out if they wanted to, and they're choosing not to because they're more comfortable with the reality they've constructed for themselves. Right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, going back to like the 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 iconography though, and and the power of these images, you know, we have even in the like early two thousands and twenty tens, I believe. Like, do y'all remember the SpongeBob episode with Anchor Arms? I never watched SpongeBob. No. Ah, oh, well, see, that's perfect. something that. Um, I, well, I feel like that's part of the fallout of like the roided out nineties, right? That it's an episode where SpongeBob in this catalog or or on a TV late night infomercial or something, 
sees um, this ad for these inflatable arms. And, you know, it's it's the story of this shark who's like, you know, before I got anchor arms, you know, I was I was weak and scrawny, but now I'm a jerk and everyone loves me. And, you know, SpongeBob gets these inflatable arms and he goes to the muscle beach and he's like, oh, you're so strong. And he tries to pick stuff up and he can't even pick up like the drink at the bar. It's really funny. Or the, you know, it's a juice bar. It's not an actual bar. Um, and then, you know, in the end, he keeps, you know, pumping them up with more air and more air until they finally pop. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's it's just it's kind of that idea once again of like this um, obsession with like bigness and and making sure everybody sees you and knows you and and perceives you as somehow better because of that increase in size. Hmm. Um, and so th that that came to mind also when I was thinking about um, Gaston because you know part of why he stuck with so many people was because of the how extreme his proportions are his his not just you know face wise but also you know muscularly and, and anatomically right mm. and i think you as know. well during the 90s like that was the era of um oh oh uh, fabio and yeah, well uh kind of fabio arnold Schwartz coming out of the 80s right yeah coming he, fabio was more um central to the 80s but arnold schwarzenegger you're right most of his big hits were in the late 80s bleeding into the 90s yeah right and you think about stallone with with rambo yeah was yeah. that 80s or 90s that was 80s that was 80s. and we now know yeah. that he had taken hgh i believe to you know achieve that kind of more heightened um hyper masculine it's quotes, hard to large like that that is not normal i mean I, it's i don't want to say it's not normal but like it takes years, and years, and years worth of effort to that's not like the natural progression of uh, of any nor of any regular human i was just going to point out someone else and has gone out of my head someone who like is jacked like that but it's gone out of my head now i'm sorry i is had it an recent example. or in the past it was in the past it was another 80s icon and it's gone out of my head the guy who played he-man Dolph Lundgren that's who I'm thinking of he yes. was jacked as hell this man was a giant not only was he like seven feet tall but he was just humongous and I wanted to say that like even though as a gainer and a man who prefers my men to have chub on them to have belly on them to have moobs and big white asses that jiggle there are there are some exceptions to that rule. Like I do follow someone who's over on livemuscle.com, but he doesn't look like that relief map of veins that some bodybuilders become, you know, it's like, you can see every striation mm -hmm. mark in the musculature and everything. He's right. enormous, but he's also like very well sufficiently padded. Like his mm. ass is round and bubbly. He's got a gut. He's got, you know, soft padding on his arms and chest. And like, there is something about this man that just drives me nuts Oof. I feel like this is where our Venn diagram meets. <laughs> Baby, Eddie Hall, just come on now. <laughs> oh my God. No, but, and there's different, and I think that's important to acknowledge that there's like different types of, of muscular builds even. You know, there was a meme going around, I think this summer, that it's like, it's like a graph. It's like a matrix that's like more musculature, more body fat. And, and, and more fat. And you got like super- It was extremely- with a yeah. twink in the in the other and then you kind of see like you you would almost imagine oh in the middle the body is going to be the same but no they're actually very very different depending on like the fat to muscle ratio and, and to be fair whoever assembled that like clearly did not do very much homework and i don't think really understood that much about anatomy but it was an yeah. interesting idea and i yeah. think it started a lot of interesting conversations about like body composition and like what are you interested in and what's good mm. because i feel like you know a lot of times within like the like bodybuilding circles are like oh I, I want my veins i like you know i'm getting all vascular and then there's like a lot of people on the other side that are like ew I don't like veins like like you know and you have um, women who try to hide varicose veins right and they and they undergo procedures to change that um but then you've got like some of these very intense bodybuilders who are, are shredded and whether through substance use or through like natural means try to emphasize vascularity it's really interesting seeing who values what and i think it's important to question um where these interests come from and understand that you know, beauty is not a monolith. Yeah. yeah. I mean, ironically, talking about beauty and the beast and, you know, again, that narrative of like, beauty is not always linear or straightforward. I think obviously the narrative of Gaston is, this is the the ultimate 
of what you're supposed to find attractive, you know, like he's meant to have everything going right for him, but the personality is not there, or the character is, is poor, versus the beast who's meant to be wild and unkempt, um, which you also see based on his characterization, you know, he's like eating with his claws and paws at one bit, and then, you know, they're trying to teach he's, him, yeah. to, you know, soup with a spoon, or, you he's know. He's a bit of a sloppy bear. Quite <laughs> literally, you know. Um <laughs> But it's 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 interesting. Sloppy bear. That yeah. <laughs> is that like Yogi's cousin? <laughs> You're it just be crawling out of the steam works at three o'clock in the morning, like <laughs> need some bubbers, Davy. <laughs> oh my god. Um, I did want to ask actually, you know, it, focusing a little bit on that song because I think that is like sort of heightened version of like a like fight dozen eggs. Is there a moment that you can think of in musical theatre or just in like any kind of like song in like a Disney production or something where it kind of like has a similar element of like muscle or like body obsession? Well, I was just going to say like when you mentioned that, um, I hadn't really thought about, uh, I don't think that many characters uh, are so contextualized by their body, at least not in the in the things that they talk about or sing about. And I think that's why Gaston's like uniquely uh, superficial and hence uniquely perhaps villainous, right? He he represents you know narcissism, um, because you know King Triton is more buff than Gaston was, and he he never wears a shirt. But you know he's not like oh I'm the buffest king in the sea. No, he's he's just there in his power. Um, and, and I'm trying to think, well, Hercules, which came a little later, you know, later 90s, yeah. you know, you got the muses singing him. He's like, you know, um, Hercules, oh, he, girl, I think you mean Hercules, you know. Yeah, exactly. And he, you know, he had a pair of pretty pecs and all that, you know, that the, the muses sing about. Um, but right, that's kind of, but he's a hero, you know, and so they're, they're um, chalking it up to, oh, these are his virtues. He's not only a good guy fighting good battles, he also looks great. Whereas with Gaston, the the superficial is used to kind of like highlight like oh he's so self-absorbed he doesn't care about anybody but himself um and yet we still love him for some fucked up reason i i chalk it up to to daddy issues for much of the gay community (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're probably not wrong and i will admit that when luke evans played him i was like get it luke you look fucking good (laughs) There was a picture uh, going around recently of Henry Cavill. I think he's in some kind of like hockey, like sports gear or something. He's got a beanie on and shirt, like just like ridden up, showing the titties. Have you seen this? Mm-hmm. Um, no, I haven't seen that actually. Um, I'll have to check out that image. But you know, Tim, you mentioned um, the in the movie. I seeing the movie, I was actually kind of like disappointed. I'm like, you mean they couldn't have picked a bigger guy to like a star? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, but I did, you know, Luke Evans is pretty stacked and he does have it like, I, 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 he's never going to listen to this. So it doesn't matter. He has a very <laughs> odd looking face to me. Like, I'm not saying it's unattractive. It's not conventionally handsome. There is something a little askew about the way he looks, but I still find him very attractive. And yet Disney keeps putting him in things where they are making him ugly as sin lately. Like I just saw the Pinocchio remake and he's in it and he looks like shit. Oh, cool. so, Who does he play? He plays the coachman. Interesting. Which also, that I'm movie is a steaming up. pile of shit. I don't care if <laughs> Disney hears me. I, that, that movie is a steaming pile of shit. It's completely and utterly pointless. Damn y'all, get ready to have the sponsorships pulled. <laughs> uh, all, all of the sponsorships, all of that money, and that sweet, sweet cheddar that we were making. Uh, it's gone. It's gone. Right. Looking, I'm Google searching this guy because you know I'm I'm terrible with celebrity names and and faces. Oh, he usually played unless. Oh, see another thing I haven't seen. <laughs> I know I'm not. I don't usually go. Well, to the he movies. also played in the Last Witcher. He was in the Tudors. He played um, Charles Brandon. Um, mm-hmm. He's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, he's a very very good looking man. I can grant him that, but. Oh, he absolutely is. No, and he's very, like, fit. Like, his body looks great. But for Gaston, I was thinking they pick somebody more extreme looking. You know, at least based on what the initial cartoon visuals. So I'm I'm seeing it, right? And he looks great and he looks wonderful. But 
you know, put him next to animated Gaston, who, you know, doesn't have fixed proportions of shape, right? Mm -hmm. Like he he kind of, for this one scene, oh, he looks a lot bigger. And for the other one, he just looks like tall and wide maybe. But yeah, yeah I mean, that, and that's the thing that I think that's part of why so much of uh, like this generation has body dysmorphia because cartoons in the 90s we're just like now i'm big now i'm small now i'm tall and skinny and now i'm fat as shit like you know you see scooby-doo you know they they eat some food and they're like oh all around and then the next thing they're running away from the ghost you know or any number of other things which you know have been touched on on this podcast before um but you know gaston is no exception to that you know there's the part where uh he talks about oh every last inch of me is covered in hair and then they and then his chest is like immediately takes up the whole screen and he's like huge and massive um yeah exactly beautiful stuff <laughs> i mean i do love me a hairy man i am all into body hair so i don't know if that was the impetus of it or if there was something else before that but it was uh, oddly sexual uh, an oddly sexual moment for a children's film all, all of Disney has oddly sexual stuff in it because some of the animators <laughs> are secretly putting shit in there just to give themselves something to laugh at. You know, if you're animating the same thing over and over again, it has to be sanitized to this level that literally anyone can watch it. Of course, you're going to put subliminal shit in there. No, it's, also, exactly. it's, it's also just interesting, right? I think it comes back to the whole thing of like, they couldn't see sexuality being a problem anywhere except when it's gay. You know, so it's it's totally fine to have non-consensual kissing heterosexual love breaking the curse all of this weird shit but god forbid buzz lightyear's um female commander should like peck another woman on the lips because dozens of countries around the world have banned the film from cinemas for that exact reason like i was just going, saying i didn't realize this was the thing and now i really want to go watch it <laughs> but then it's also disney like how many more movies is disney going to be like the first ever gay like no no stop this it's like rupaul saying the first ever trans like guarantee you season 15 they're still gonna have the first ever trans something on this fucking show because it's just like uh absolute headache honestly well, and i remember the hoofla that came out when they made the remake about how oh lefou is going to be openly gay well lefou never states at any point in the film that he's gay and the moment that everyone had a problem with was it's the very last sequence of the film they're all dancing and happy because the beast has been turned back into a human and it's going to be this happily ever after shit and for two seconds maybe even less than two seconds they show lefou and this tall guy like they're they're dancing together for a second almost like like it was a mistake they weren't supposed to be dancing together but then they yeah. like look into each other's Blink. eyes and yeah blinking blink you'll, you'll miss it, miss it. Mm -hmm. And that was enough to rile up, I guess, Moms Against Disney and a few other groups that have nothing better to do with their time. All of that. But I do want to ask, are there any, like, modern films that you feel like would inspire muscle gainers? Yeah, so maybe... I mean, you can find all kinds of inspiration in all kinds of places. I think it depends on what you and your particular mind and psyche and issues and proclivities like lead you into, right? Because um, like a lot of guys who are into um, this sort of thing often will cite like comic books or superhero movies, you know, um, these skin tight, you know, um, costumes on these buff superheroes. It doesn't leave a lot to the imagination and it highlights the more extreme things, the, the protruding parts of the anatomy, the shoulders, the pecs, the, you know, the quads, um, you know, sometimes even the junk, right? Yeah, that's right, I see. <laughs> well, no, because as you say this, it makes me think of the Joel Schumacher Batman films where he gave them nipples. It's With like, the why does the bat I, I suit have forget. to have nipples? <laughs> bat nipples? Um, because you have yeah. to know what to lick, Tim. <laughs> yeah, in, in the Joel Schumacher movies, so that would be Batman Forever and Batman and Robin um their bat suits and robin's suit have nipples and abs and i'm pretty sure a much more pronounced package now joel schumacher is a gay man so maybe that had a lot of influence on it but it's like why does batman have to have nipples on his suit goodness me similarly captain falcon has those little nipple things on on smash bros Oh, I've never played if you, Smash Bros. If you change the color of his character, sometimes they have like they have contrasting elements, like it's the piping or the buttons or something. And he's got two little like colorful nipples that'll change colors. Um, I can't remember if that was just in Melee or if it's in the current game. Um, I play, you know, I play whatever you know other people are playing, but I, I noticed that and I was always kind of funny. 
Uh -huh, um, but you're not not horny at all. So, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, there's only so horny you can be at the two your character screen before you have to jump in and like kick everybody's ass. So, sure. um, well, I was just going to make a real quick um, talking about films that may inspire muscle gainers, because when I said Batman and Robin, who was in that, but Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Mr. Freeze and he's playing like the most buffed out humongous version of Mr. Freeze that they've ever had, because in the comics and in previous iterations, Mr. Freeze is seen as a much lankier, taller, skinnier man who he's is in this science. bulked suit, you know, because he was a scientist. So he's in this, you know, suit that keeps him alive, essentially. Uh, and then when they did the Batman and Robin, they, of course, tap Schwarzenegger to play him, which is also like the worst character in that movie. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, and Bane is also in that movie, the guy playing Bane. And Bane is a character, like, when you press a button on his chest, he swells up and becomes even more muscular, so. Yeah, there's a lot of that imagery. And you think back to, like, um, like the Hulk or the Thing in Fantastic Four. Mm -hmm. You've got those, of course, very extreme figures. But I'm, uh, So back to your question, James, about, like, like, contemporary kind of things. I mean, any number of superhero movies, perhaps. Although I think that the some of the imagery is like a little less extreme than before um they're more going for like an athletic look you know um rather than a, a roided out look that might be considered more extreme but like i don't know, I don't know. I chris evans in like the reveal shot of the captain america transformation where it's like the metal doors and the of the smoke and you just see clearly they've like done a little bit of like shading on like every fucking ab and just the <laughs> side of the titty because that man looks like he is slabs of rock stacked yeah. on top of the other you know greased up to the high heavens um fun fact um. <laughs> the, the, the moment in the film where peggy carter just sort of like subconsciously like reaches out to touch him apparently that was unplanned because that was the moment they actually revealed him shirtless to her and she was like oh I, I just I don't know what to do with myself so they deliberately use that to uh, <laughs> is that is that word kaflemp verklempt verklempt that's the verklempt <laughs> I'm verklempt I don't know girl yeah. I don't know but anyways um kind of focusing on the movie for a sec how do you feel like the original compares to the remake especially when you consider Gaston I I mean right nostalgia is a huge thing and and it's it's, it's uh, it, it clouds our our, our judgment, uh, possibly impairing it sometimes. But I'm I, I tend to have a very special place in my heart for the the Disney animated version, not only because of the visuals and you know what we're used to seeing, but also because of the music. I felt like the amount of auto tune they used in the remake was positively dreadful. Like it's like Siri sings Bell, right? Oh it's my like, God, Baker Emma with Watson can't group. sing. Emma yeah, and that's the thing that bothers me about a lot of remakes. That... Well, James, yeah. you and I were talking about how in Hollywood today they are they're not dubbing anymore because that was the thing of the past. They would dub. Yeah, they could do singing. If... They could do singing in the rain yeah. and have like a real singer sing it. Like when West Side Story, they had um, it was Natalie Wood, mm -hmm. but Marnie Nixon covered her, who was yeah. like a legit like singer. And I, I wish they would do that more now because, yeah, okay, fine. You want your star power? That's great. You know, they also did that with Anastasia um, in the 90s. They had Meg Ryan voice Meg it, Ryan, but it was yeah. actually Liz Calloway who sang the part. I don't know why these people are like, oh, we'll get this celebrity to try and sing, even though they have no training or degrees. Like, what? I'm so sorry. And that alone makes me really, really um, have a big chip on my shoulder about the remake that Disney did. I'm like, you guys are Disney. You have access to the best um, talent in the world, arguably, at least in the Western Hemisphere, you couldn't have picked someone who has Broadway training or who is an opera singer or so something. You couldn't have utilized Audra McDonald more, the woman who actually could sing. Yeah. And oh that's my god, thing. as when you the, have the a wardrobe of all things, like why couldn't she who overshadows Belle completely? Why couldn't she be Mrs. Potts? Like Audra McDonald as Mrs. Potts makes far more sense in my head. You know, like who did they have as Mrs. Potts in this? It one? was uh, it's Emma uh, Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson. Exactly. I always get the Emmas confused because there's like a million of them. There's too many Emmas. But like, if it was Angela Lansbury reprising the role, and I know her voice isn't the same these days, like I'd, I'd at least accept that as like a legacy piece, you know. And I would have been like, okay, if Paige O'Hara had been some kind of character in that, would have lived. But 
no, it felt like they made such weird fucking choices. And I mean, like, what what's a good example here? When they did season one of Super Secret Celebrity Drag Race, and on one of the episodes, there was this girl called Madison Beer. And I was watching with my housemates at the time, and I was fully like, I don't know who this is. And one of my housemates was like, oh, she's meant to be a singer? And I'm like, meant to be a singer? And then was kind of like Googling her. Even Google doesn't know what to classify her as. Because basically, she comes from enough money that her parents were like, oh, she'll be good at something. So they just put her in the Hollywood machine. She's tried her hand at modeling, acting, and singing. And she keeps not becoming a star because she's clearly not good enough. But she, quote unquote, looks the part. So they just keep putting her into shit. See, that's like a spit in the face to everybody who has chosen to specialize in anything ever. <laughs> like, God help anyone who's got a modicum of talent. Because when you've got a face like this, fuck, they'll never look twice. But God, get a little bit of work done. Put zero effort. And you know what? Maybe that actually circles back to the whole Gaston thing. Because yeah, it's about appearances. It's all about appearances, <laughs> sis. It's all about the lurk. So you know, there you go. And look, I do think that the remake had its problems. I think the Beast's song in the remake has has to be the shining moment. Because oh, you like it? I didn't like it. I was the one who had it all. Like as someone who's a baritone who I'm totally a tenor. I'm totally a tenor because if I'm not a fucking tenor, I'll never get any parts. But you know, I'm totally yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> but I'm actually a Barry, as is most men. Fun fact. Yeah, that's the most common voice, natural voice type. Most dudes, after their balls drop or whatever, sit Barry. somewhere in the baritone-ish range. Baritone-ish. You know, and Gaston is exceptional because he's a baritone, so he gets the kind of you know do both Let's of those play a little registers. Bit. But I mean, got more notes <laughs> without without trying to get all like get too deep into the whole like tenors, uh, whatever thing. But like, I I thought that was a really great song because I was just like, even though it's like transposed into bass, I think even in the Barry range, it's still quite beautiful. It's quite a nice song because there's really not a lot of like for auditions songs that you can like really sing to. Every time I audition, it's like. Uh, like trying to like how far can i go to sustain this before that's bad so you know i thought that part was nice but really centering on the whole gaston thing it's just an interesting comparison like you say there's this real step away from overt musculature and this real sort of like centering in on like athleticism athleticism is really the kind of du jour focal point now because you you now get people pointing at fucking muscle gainers bodybuilders and everything with fat phobia like yeah too many muscles he's got all these muscles he looks very fat there's not an ounce of fat on him but they're calling him fat (laughs) yeah it's wild what I guess quote unquote normies like how their how their view of other people is distorted and shaped by things like that phobia right mm, my god as a sort of rounding out question here i want to ask what what do you as a muscle gainer what do you most want to see out of movies like that could display musculature in the way that you like like is there a particular theme that you want to see uh is it diversity is it age is it a story character what do you most want to see i think it would be refreshing to see like maybe more realistic portrayals of like the time and effort it takes to make any progress in a natural way um because i think that contributes to a lot of issues that people have specifically male identifying people who you know are beholden to these standards and these ideas um just because like when you're doing it you're like oh my god am i making any progress at all i had like a bout of that this last week and i'm just like oh my god like why do i even try do i need to keep trying like does it matter am i going to achieve anything unless i you know juice myself up and of course the answer is yes you can but it's like very 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 small increments and i'm not saying right that they need to make a movie that's 10 years like that goes over you know it's 10 years long but like, I don't know, maybe more realistic portrayals of of what kind of work and dedication and, and what factors surround that would be refreshing. Um, also, like different kinds of, of muscular would also be interesting to see because, you know, right, we see the very fit, athletic, 
does a lot of cardio. You can see his abs and titties, but like there's less of like, there's this linebacker built guy and he's really hot and desirable. No, it's usually like, they're usually the comic relief if they're portrayed at all in any way, right? So I think it'll be, I'd really love to see like different kinds of, of guys with with different levels of of you know musculature and like you know maybe they're they're bulky or maybe they're bulking for a period or something and you see you know more realistic portrayals and not like oh he was on this like crash diet for six months and now he's at like single digit percent body fat um because that's what a lot of people assume like oh well that's that's what muscular is because you know right you see the people who go to these like um big bodybuilding shows that you know have are going for a very specific and very narrowly defined aesthetic of like this is what show ready is you know you spray paint your body brown um regardless of if you're white which always struck me as weird and you go down to like single digit percent body fat so you can see every trembling you know trembling quivering muscle and vein so that they can you know it's kind of like um a lot of people are disgusted by like like pageants it's kind of like the opposite end of that it's like look how you know manly and muscular i can be and you know while that's very fulfilling for some people and i would be wrong to disparage them for it i just think more representation of like different types of muscular builds would be a really interesting and positive thing i think i like that more more love for the dad bod you know yeah give me more guys that look like thor after um the infinity wars like give me a more beer belly yes please door. yes but not for <laughs> but not a padding but... suit don't don't make it fake like make it no you just know, get a, a big who really... guy who's like yeah, actually exactly. big get an actual <clears throat> fat actor oh there aren't any famous ones why because you don't hire them fuck i don't know guys like insert entire like ugh, frustrating conversation about Brendan Fraser in a fat suit. I want to see Brendan Fraser win, but I don't want to see him in a fat suit. Like I'd right. rather have a 600 pound dude because also if a 600 pound dude was on set, he might've had the time to turn around and say to people, Hey, just so you know, this isn't a good look, Aronofsky, like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But I find it interesting. You make that point about, you know, showing that diversity of musculature because people only have an understanding of what muscle is based on what they've seen similar to the whole like Gaston pageantry like if this is what you believe it is then that's all it is to you it's a conversation that happens about drag race and the importance of diversity on drag race we need to have black queens allowed to be weird and creative because when uh, Nina Benita Brown was on season nine people went after her as if she was crazy even though Sasha Valore was doing similar stuff uh same thing with gaining everyone thinks it's some weird fetish where we're all trying to kill ourselves because the only examples of gaining they've ever seen is on exploitative documentary style stuff that gets shared around you know it's important to yeah. have representation and good representation to the extent that maybe if you have some fat jokes or fat suits and things like that it doesn't have to matter because it's less than a percent of what gets shown but you know we're all still fighting for space and i think that's fair showing some healthy examples of musculature and you know even the desire to grow even if it's extreme presenting it in a healthy way where it's a fulfillment for the person rather than a feeling of i have to be the biggest and if not i'm a failure you know this right and also portraying it as like these people are sane and this is a desire that they have and they're honoring themselves through it not like oh well this person is crazy so they're going for this unrealistic thing you know or this unhealthy thing right exactly ways in which muscle gaining is a part of gaining because i think this is also something that we spoke on a little bit last time there's this idea that muscle gainers are weird why are they here they're not trying to necessarily get fat they're not one of us when actually you very much are you share a lot of the same plight and let's be real i think a big difference we spoke about last time between a lot of muscle gainers and bodybuilders is that muscle gainers are quite happy getting a bit fat with a belly and some soft tits because there's still muscle underneath they've still got the bone and, and all of that strength but there's a little bit of something that we all like a little bit of you know exactly and it actually kind of helps like make the the physique like poof out a little and make things look a bit more extreme uh without having to resort to to chemical interference and once again no judgment to those who go for that because that is, that is a personal choice and i would be a hypocrite if i shot on it because i have been attracted to people who have uh, gone for that and that's fine um even if i myself haven't pursued that 
course of action for myself. Um, but yeah, the way I've explained it to a lot of people um, who are not in the know is like it's like bodybuilding on your own terms. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's not like, oh, well, I have to be, you know, 5% body fat because, you know, my personal trainer said so. It's like, no, I'm crafting the physique, my own image in a way that honors what I would like to be and what I am interested in. Um, and I, I think there needs to be more appreciation of of interests that don't necessarily align with the mainstream. <laughs> Do you feel like there's anything with Gaston that we haven't really touched on that we should circle back to? I feel like there's his relationship with LeFou just kind of there's something there with how a lot of gay men will like pursue people who like don't give them the time of day. And I, I it's you know, I know Disney didn't write it in that way explicitly, but it very much mirrors how a lot of uh men in the community will pine after someone who's, you know, so beautiful and this and that and without any regard for like like respecting themselves or or you know um how, picking up cues that they're per perhaps not being treated or uh correctly or being respected and i would love to add to that <clears throat> the trend in a, a part of the gainer community where people are simping over like a bodybuilder that is pretending to put on weight or has put on just oh. a little bit of weight and the is baiting, like sort of dipping the, the their fishing. For, yeah the fishing like oh I see that this particular demographic likes it, that I don't have my rock hard abs anymore. Let me lean into this. I can make money. Now I paid, I, I won't say the name. I paid $25 <laughs> for one month to look at a particular person's exclusive quote unquote content. And I'm like, this ain't no, <laughs> this is not a gay man. This is a heterosexual man who is trying to take all of our money. And like, and it's, it's still going on and people still simp over it. And I, I get it. The man is very beautiful. But this is a man who, if you saw him in the street, he would pay no attention to you whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. And maybe, you know, and right, it, it wasn't necessarily by design the way they wrote that, but it, it does reflect a lot in, in the social dynamics we have and the, uh, as far as like desirability and who gets chased and who does the chasing. Yeah. There's definitely a conversation about privilege there as well. You know, uh, the beast we see him as attractive, but he's meant to be portrayed in a way that is meant to be unattractive versus Gaston, who is attractive and actually isn't. And it's this interesting narrative on challenging what is your inclination to, you know, like how, how is it that Bell started to see the human inside of the beast, you know, like where did that come from? Stockholm I, syndrome, clearly. <laughs> You know, I think it's it's a really powerful film, and I like this conversation. I think this actually needs to be its own episode where we really pick up on the whole like ways in which we treat each other. So I was going to say we've never had this in the gainer community where there is a cohort that is pursued and a cohort that is not pursued, and we certainly don't have a rubric of determining that one type of body is more valid than another, and we don't certainly give people shit for not emulating perfectly our very specific desires of body. No, we have never done that, never will do that. We are <laughs> we are safe from this self-flagellation. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> But no, I yep, think no, these things are more universal than one might uh, initially think that they are. Yeah. Circling back to a conversation we've had umpteenth times uh, about how, as gainers, we love to talk about how our experiences are unique and separate to the world. And no one could ever understand us. Uh, and yet we probably experience the exact same shit that most other people do. So we should probably spend more time working together to get over our trauma and shit. You know, that's maybe the takeaway there. Yeah, it's it's that um, I believe Buddhist idea that you know separation is an illusion, right? Yeah. There's a lot more common in common between us as humans than we might initially assume. Yeah, you asked me recently if I'm a Buddhist, and I think I will become one just to sort because, of because like... because you want to have statues of the fat Buddha around your house. Is that what you're saying? Oh my God! So literally, do not scalp me like that. How very dare you! <laughs> Um, no, I don't want statues of the fat Buddha. I want statues of me because I'm going to be a fat Buddha. Like, it's Is that heresy, though? Are you, like, making a graven image? No way, I'm thinking Christian theology. I, I don't really know how Buddhists feel about that sort of thing. Maybe they're accepting. I don't know. 
I'm not too sure. I don't imagine that they care that much, or at least if they do care, it's probably not as much as the Christians do. But I mean, it's probably like a Pokemon evolution. I want to go from human to Uncle Iroh to Buddha. And then I want to evolve into a, um, I want to evolve into a Helix mattress, you know? <laughs> that's that's oh, goals. The, the journey. Yeah. Is that your mega evolution or, or your, um, or your Galarian form or are you Gigantamaxing? I mean, there's so many ways I'm, I'm I could go. Cause that, that makes a lot more canonical sense. Tim's like, what? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. It's Pokemon. So basically think about, it's like, it's like in Dragon Ball Z where they're like, ah, and their hair gets bigger and they go super, oh, when they go super It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that, except they just become a larger, flashier version of whatever they were before. Oh, okay. Which is delightful. But I think that kind of brings us to the end of the episode. So thank you so much. Literally so. Thank you so much for being with us today. Where can people find you online? Uh, well, thank you so, so much. Um, you can find me on at uh, so Bear Cub on Instagram. Um, and that is uh, so bear cub as in that's so raven but oh that's so bear cub because everything i post about it's very berry in nature uh <laughs> um but yes uh thank you so much for having me on the podcast gents it's always a pleasure to speak with both of you um and to to tackle these uh interesting topics uh thanks so much <laughs> you're very welcome Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, that's a wrap for now here on Thick Radio. Please remember to like and subscribe, rate us five stars, and leave a good review. If you liked this episode, the podcast, or just us in general, share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in. You can find me on Instagram and beefy frat at Stanham. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, and Beefy Frat at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on TikTok at Thick Radio or our website at www.podpage.com forward slash Thick Radio. And if you want to submit any questions or ideas for episodes, you can reach us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye fats. Bye fats. Let's talk about it. Thick Radio is a Patreon and Enter app podcast produced by Stan and Dickie Mouse. Next and mastered by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Lucky 2. Our theme song is provided by Spotify Cream.